Hey, Tommy, guess what time it is? It's two o'clock and it's time for a truck stop webinar. This is a new format. This is the Kingpin Live. For those of you who have met many MCIF events, I think of all the nicknames for Tommy, I think Kingpin is the is the coolest one, Tom. Uh, well, Drew, I, call, Drew calls me the son of a trucker on the, on the road talk radio show, so it depends on which way you want to go. <laughs> I'm thrilled to have with us today uh, two industry experts, and I mean that uh, sincerely, Keith Dunlap and Drew Easton, who are both members of the MCIF Board of Directors. Gentlemen, thank you very much for spending 45 minutes or so with us and our audience today. Sure. Um, now, Tom, I can only tell you this, that working in the insurance industry for 40 years, occasionally people would mislabel me an expert. They would say, oh, you know everything. And, you know, you don't really want to necessarily burst their bubble, Drew. So when I get asked a question that I wasn't really sure of the answer or I halfway thought I knew the answer, I said, I'll be right back with you. And then I'd pick up the phone and I'd call Tommy and say, Tommy, what do you think? And usually, not usually, not even 75% of the time, I'd say about 95%. I give you a 95 plus, Tom. I think that, I think that the, uh, the answers that you provided to thousands of people through the decades have probably saved us or made us look smarter than we are, Drew. I don't know. I would well, agree I with that. Something, if I had to do something for pollution, I can't send it back to Drew. So I, if I don't know what I, I know people who do or, or, or Keith or somebody else that uh, those things. So at least I'm a conduit. Somebody once said, John, I don't know much. I just know a lot of people and I've heard a lot of things. And I have a good memory. There is truth to that. I mean, the truth is, is that uh, if I've got a claims question, I'm going to call Keith. And if I want to know something about environmental uh, issues related to that sort of a trucking, trucking uh, industry question, I'm calling Drew. And so even Tommy, the kingpin, has his own panel of experts for certain uh, aspects of what it is that we do. And here we have it today. Um, you know, I would like to encourage the audience to ask your questions in the chat window. We'll read them and we will answer them. Uh, to start with, we have a question. Uh, I'll ask it and then the panel may answer as you wish. And this is very informal. And uh, once again, here we go. And thank you very much. So the, the question is, we have an autonomous extra heavy truck tractor involved in an accident. Is this a product liability claim or is this an auto liability claim to our panel? Well, my, my comment is it's an auto liability claim because automobile now you might be addressing who's liable and I'll let Keith talk about sorting out who's going to have to pay for it because who's negligent there could be the driver could be the mechanic could be the manufacturer could be uh, the software provider it's going to be a lot of moving parts but uh, I just see a lot of dollar size Keith I don't know about you <laughs> well if you look at the ISO coverage grant Tommy it focuses on ownership maintenance or use right so right. there's no doubt that the, there's no doubt that the vehicle is is owned by the name insured is being used by the name insured. Uh, so a good sound argument could uh, plan attorney could argue that the incident, regardless of whether there's a driver behind the wheel, um, could be considered a auto liability event and covered under a traditional ISO definition. Um, my personal and this is going to be an emerging area of law, obviously over the next ten years as, he, as more and more of these vehicles are are put on the highways, um, I have a feeling that plaintiff attorneys will eventually gravitate to the type of insurance agreement that has the larger limits. And, and the, if the larger limits are following a product uh -oh. liability policy, um, I have a feeling that they'll, that they'll try to make claim under that, under that particular policy to be able to secure all the limits they can for the event. Or that, that's just my own personal JV belief about plaintiff attorneys. I, I think they'll go with the deep pockets on. Keith, I want to point up something, and I appreciate you managing the insurance agreement. What we forget sometimes, the insurance agreement, ownership, and maintenance. So here's going to be a big part. If they attempt to maintain that technology themselves, there's going to be more liability. If they outsource it, then they would not be responsible for it. So there might be, from an underwriting standpoint, Drew might have to ask who's doing the maintenance on it to find out if it's going to be 
their shop itself, which would be auto liability or somebody's GL, meaning that they are professional liability from the uh, software stuff. So, you know, it's going to be a lot of moving parts. So, Tommy, is it fair to say, if, if, as a follow up question, kind of even rhetorically, does the issue of an autonomous vehicle simplify or complicate the liability scenario that we'll be looking at in the future? It complicates it, doesn't it? Because, I mean, we've got different avenues to, to uh, different pockets, different policies, different issues, right? Well, it, 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 we got to answer that question with a couple of caveats, John. It might not be any more complicated for the auto liability carrier. They might have more opportunity to bring more people in. Clearly, it's going to be more complicated from Keith handling the claim, <laughs> uh, orchestrating the rest of the people. Uh, there's some advantage, Keith. You can talk about having somebody else's pocket there to share it if it's a bad loss. <laughs> so well, well, then, then let me ask the question, Tommy. I'll ask it this way. In your opinion, would plaintiff's attorneys welcome or kind of sigh at the fact that we're going to have autonomous vehicles on the road? You think they're going to look forward to to this uh, to this uh, exposure, or do you think it's going to alleviate? or lessen the auto liability uh, scenario that we're looking at in our country now? Well, again, I Obviously, want to, John, the court cases will have to determine that. At this point, I think they're looking for a new ground and there's gonna be a lot of stuff, a lot of uh, discussion about it. And there's gonna be a lot of early court cases. And once we get a few rulings, then we got directions who's gonna do it. Keith, I think right now, I don't think they're solid, over. I don't think they're looking forward to it, but they some it's on their ra radar screen somewhere uh, as they bring this up. Well, and also side side note, I don't I've not seen maybe you folks have I've not seen any legislative changes or changes at the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration that would provide any kind of safe harbor to a trucking company that has these type of trucks. So I think they're going to be subject to the same federal regs uh, that they've traditionally been. Uh, used to complying with it's just that you won't have a driver in the, in, in the seat um, again I think it's a whole new it's going to be a whole new interesting emerging area of law I did work a lot of uh, autonomous claims uh, at Gallagher Bassett when I was there uh, we, we handled the Google account for instance and um, we had about 150 of those losses when I left and they're very uh, I mean the data that they can deliver to you from that truck um, is almost insurmountable. Uh, and so I don't think, to answer your question, John, I don't think plaintiff attorneys are going to want to see those type of vehicles on the road uh, because they they just capture everything. And by and large, those trucks don't make errors. I mean, you get, many times they get hit by drunk drivers at an intersection that simply doesn't, they don't see the vehicle. Um, and I, I think that by and large, my recall about those claims is that most of them were very, very defendable and that the third party, the private passenger motorist was at fault for the incident. So. Uh, I, I, it's going to be an interesting evolution over the next few years, that's for sure. Excellent point. Drew, what say ye? Uh, you were getting ready to comment. That's exactly where I was going with Keith's comment. You know, the intent with these autonomous vehicles is that they're going to be safer than a steering wheel holder. And the intent is, if that's the case, we're going to have less frequency or less severity associated with our trucks. So I would expect that we may be upsetting, upsetting the apple cart with plate of spar because they may have fewer cases to adjudicate. And I don't know if that's actually going to be the case, but I suspect that might be something we're going to see. Well, uh, and you're taking important, you're taking important uh, uh, ammunition away from the plaintiff's counsel. Mm -hmm. I mean, their their main focus is on the frailty of the driver and his hours of service, and yep. and uh, maybe he has trace amounts of cannabis in his blood. Uh, when you take the driver out of the equation, um, you've changed the game in the market, and, and we're all going to have to get used to that because the plaintiffs are not going to be able to pick on the driver anymore. They're going to be able to pick on that remote operator that controlled that vehicle. Um, so I, I look forward to, you know, as, as these develop, you know, the, the legal defenses are going to be certainly unique. I think, yeah, you know, the drive, the truck can't text or use a cell phone. No. <laughs> The, the, the problem is going to be it's going to take more investigation actually what caused the crash and then this is yeah. where the product liability the original question john who's going to sort those things out uh when it happened and so i think in that case lawyers are looking at that it's going to cost far more money to i think to 
to come to the conclusion of what caused the crash, at least for a long time until we got some history and some frequency that we can look at that this crash was happened. So the second one happened just like the first one happened. So you can start building a, 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 a some reference material on those things. Mm -hmm. But that you're taking out the negligent entrustment allegations, which are huge you, today by the plaintiff's bar. You're taking out all the focus on the driver and, hit, and whether, like you said, Tommy, he may have been distracted by cell phone use or, or something else. So when you take those very volatile things away from the plaintiff attorney as tools, um, you basically have neutered them in, in a large, in a, to a large degree. Well, so, thank you. Anyways. Maybe we're moving more towards a question of fact rather than a question of law, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Excellent discussion. There are two questions that uh, relate to this subject. We could cover them both. It's okay with you guys. So in the generic area of, uh, of losses and claims, what, what would be the best thing that we can do to, this is the question. I'll read it directly. As a motor carrier today, how can I best guard against a runaway or unexpected verdict? Obviously, we're talking about after a loss has occurred. What do y'all think about that? Well, you know, um, wow, well, you know, full day seminars, John, are typically devoted to this just this topic today. Um, it's it, there's many things a motor carrier can do. Um, you know, whether they're whether the fleet self administers, whether they use a contracted third party administrator, or whether the insurance carrier is actually handing the claim, a plan is needed to combat what we're all facing today. Uh, defined investigative protocols and targeted documentation uh, need to be uh, in place if the claim is to proceed effectively. For motor carriers, um, there's no question, the business practices are on trial today. Lawsuits uh, are lottery-like, if you will, and, uh, and, and many times plaintiff attorneys are, I mean, the, um, motor carriers are just simply looking down the gun of these cases because of it, because of poor internal business practices. So, in my view, the earlier we find out about those problems associated with the hiring practice, um, problems associated with uh, the driver qualification file, things that the plaintiff attorney can exploit, the better chance we have to effectively resolve the claim early. Um, claims bar is clearly focusing on the administrative failures of the motor of the motor carrier during the hiring process um, during the during the everyday supervision of that driver uh, and whether the motor carrier is in compliance with the federal regs during those processes so basically the bottom line question is, is the motor carrier's operational practices are they in order are they defendable um, my when I speak to motor carriers directly I always advocate that uh, today uh, they should really think seriously about having a focused transportation defense lawyer review their internal hiring and supervising and training practices to see if they are defendable today um, instead of just assuming that they are. Um, the other thing about, about avoiding a runaway is it's not enough just to say you have a sound safety culture. Yeah, most fleets say that. Uh, most plant attorneys forensically dig into those processes to see if you're in compliance and also, if you're if you're enforcing those safety standards, and if they find out that that you have the ability, from a telematics perspective, to gauge hard braking, for instance, and you know a particular driver has uh, a series of hard braking events over a 60-day period, and yet you do nothing about it from a remedial standpoint or training standpoint, you're exposed as that motor carrier. And that motor carrier needs to know that that's probably likely going to be discovered by by a plaintiff attorney in a, in a follow-up lawsuit. Um, the other thing is, can, can, the, can the motor carrier avoid the reptile theory? And to me, the best way to avoid the reptile theory today and the, and the manner in which plaintiff attorneys are coming after is, is to reward your safe operators and punish your operators that are not in compliance. And it's, if, 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 if it's found out that, you're, that you're, you have no plan in place for, for drivers that are unsafe, um, it's going to significantly increase the value of that claim and the reserve on that claim. So that's, that's what I would stress to any motor carrier today to find out how 
defendable their internal processes are. Um, I also think from a practical standpoint, and this we don't talk about this much, um, but I, I think that whether if you have an outside TPA facility or the insurance carrier or whether even you're handling your claims yourself, you really need to pay attention to the pending count of those claim handlers and find out how, you know, how many, what is the pending they're working. If they're working a pending of 220 files and they're a mixture of construction defect, workers' comp, property, and oh, here's some trucking cases, that's only to me, in my mind, a mixture for uh, 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 failure. I think today, more than any time in my career, you need specialization when it comes to handling trucking claims. You cannot have generalists touching our claims today and expect to get good outcomes. I think, I think any underwriter would probably agree with that. Um, so I, I think that um, um, all the, one thing that we talked a little bit about is I also believe that we're in a scientific environment right now. If you, if you can invest in telematics and put at least front-facing cameras on your vehicle, you are way ahead of the curve today. You're way ahead of the, you, you have the ability to literally defend yourself. And, uh, and uh, these, cameras, these, cameras, these cameras, people need to know about these cameras, that they rule out police bias, they rule out witness bias, and they rule out um, participant bias. They don't, you know, the, the film doesn't lie. So I think that if you have, if you talk to any fleet that has installed these cameras, um, you see, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll probably tell you they, they wish they had done it earlier because they're extremely successful in mitigating losses today and in making the plan of attorney either go away or resolve the case on a much, uh, on your terms early on. So those are some of the things I think that you can do to avoid a runaway today. Um, ultimately, the motor carrier, whoever's handling the claims, they have to ask themselves, is my, is my house in order? Uh, is my claim file sufficiently documented to hand off to a defense attorney for a successful defense down the road? That's, that's really what you have to ask yourself. I think, I think that answer is, I, I wish that everyone involved in any severe loss ever could listen to your answer because it's not, this is not a simple recipe. It's all hands on deck recipe and you can't walk away. You have to pay attention to losses evolve the circumstances change, but I guess what I'm hearing from you, Keith, is if you're very proactive and very uh, expertly oriented in the way you're handling severe loss, it doesn't have to be a trucking loss, it's a liability. I always said this, Keith, I said, when you get to be, Tommy, a very large loss, it's really not so much a trucking loss anymore, this is a liability loss. You know, we're looking at all the aspects of, 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 of negligence and damages and uh, avoiding paying more money than we should. Drew, I wanted to ask a follow-up. Um, are you amazed in the 21st century? Or, or I should, I should, that's too much of an opinion. I should, let me ask it this way, because this was the way it was asked. What is it, how important is it to report loss promptly? Uh, to report what, I'm sorry, John? Loss promptly, to report loss as it occurs. Absolutely, that's a huge issue and it's, our business is notorious for having loss runs that come in that might not quite be accurate with how that loss occurs. I can't tell you how many times I see a loss reported from the driver's perspective, me and our motor carrier's perspective, they were not at fault. The four wheeler pulled in front of them, et cetera. Then we see this large settlement associated with for this claim paid, and we come to find out, well, those facts weren't quite the same as, uh, as reported, at least initially. Nobody wants to take blame but all we're looking for is responsibility. I think the one thing Keith was alluding to is, let's be honest, in our world, truckers are guilty until proven innocent. So we're always trying to prove that negative piece. And the other thing here is, you know, with the reptile theory and all these other factors, we've got a very sophisticated plaintiff's bar that has all kinds of tools to beat up our folks. And that safety culture that was mentioned, it's not so much that they're trying to defend an accident. Our motor carriers are trying to defend the expected, at least from the plaintiff's view. If you're not doing things properly as a motor carrier, they're going to spin this and recognize that it was expected that this loss was going to occur because you didn't do these five things. The other thing that I think we need to keep in mind as we talk about runaway verdicts or unexpected verdicts, et cetera, they're on a, uh, um, a sliding scale here. And we talk about this often on the radio, Tommy and I do with Road Dog, is that what used to be a $30,000 claim may now be a $150,000 claim. 
I don't know about you guys, but that's a pretty significant increase over that initial 30,000 that we would have paid five or 10 years ago. That almost has the smell and the taste of a runaway as well, albeit on a much smaller level, but those are daily claims. In Keith's world, I'm sure you see those with great regularity and uh, those small dollars add up to be a whole lot of big dollars as well. Yeah, well, you know, the big dollar, the big cases like the fatality events and the severe, severe injury claims that, that we know of immediately, to me, those are not the problem today. Those, those incidents have a lot of eyeballs on them almost immediately, from the insurance carrier to the reinsurer to the excess carriers. There's a lot of folks looking at those obviously severe DOT reportable accidents, and uh, very rarely do they, can they go south but because, because, because they've been recorded properly. You go out to collect the type of physical evidence and, and data you need to support that claim. What's plaguing the industry right now are the innocuous um, small impact cases that are in, that are built up from a, and, and and that are built up from scratch by the plaintiff attorney. The kind of cases where nobody claims injury at the scene, all the vehicles are driven away from the scene. Yet within 24 hours, you get a letter of rep from a high-profile lawyer in a hellhole state. That's got all the ingredients of a bad case, and you, if you don't treat that with a sense of urgency that it demands today. Uh, I'm not saying like a like a death claim, but you you better you better adopt some, some sound investigative practices immediately. You need to go out and look at the look at the vehicle, collect as much physical evidence as you can, the witness statements, obviously the telematics downloads. If, if you don't get social media investigations, possibly surveillance, if you don't do these things today on the light impact cases in the, in the hellhole states, uh, you will you will not be able to deliver that claim file. Uh, in a manner that allows for the defense of the trucker. You're going to be sitting there with, with mush in your hand, and you're going to be not knowing what to do with that big demand when it comes in nine months to a year from now. So it's the build-up claims that are killing us right now in the market, not the, not the hey. uh, normal hard-ass hard cases. Hey, Tommy, uh, a follow-up question for you. What is, what is the reptile theory? Uh, Drew and... Uh, Keith have both alluded to the reptile theory. What is that? What is that? I don't understand the reptile theory. Tell me what that means. Well, it's it's a theory, and again, a lawyer and a psychiatrist put it together, and it also very funny. It came out in 2007, right before CSA 2010 came out in physical patient. Those was this thing, and it is that the human nature is to flee or fight, and if you have a if you're threatened, you're be and what the theory is that they acted so bad, not that they take the focus off of what happened that day to their history so bad, you need to punish them so they don't, they don't damage your neighbor to kill them, that uh -huh. kill the reptile right now. And, <laughs> the, and three things to add what you just said. Keith's right. This is why, and you got some cases like Texas New Tort Reform, which says you don't move to that area until you have negligence shown. You can't induce those kind of things. That's why cameras are so important here to verify that. Texas has a very favorable. Other states are looking at that too. I see Keith nodding his head. The second thing that we recommend, John, if you remember about three years ago, having a conference, is get rid of every asset you don't need in the transport out of the transportation company. <laughs> get the buildings out. Get everything out. Even leasing the equipment here. So at one point in time, when they make these demands. The insurance company is going to have to choose either to pay policy limits, and they would have to if it's demanded because of bad faith, or and the plaintiff's guy, attorney's got to say, I'll accept it, or I'll keep fighting. Well, if they keep fighting, they can't collect anything because the trucking company doesn't own anything. And so mm -hmm. that's one way to protect that. And the other things you mentioned, exactly what Drew said, have all of your, your paperwork in order. Don't have driver standards you're not going to live to with. Don't have safety standards that to impress Drew that you're not going to do. Don't put anything down you're not going to do because it'll come back and haunt you. Because most of our motor carriers, and I understand Keith's thing and all this other stuff, most of our motor carriers are going to be, what, five, eight, ten power units here, the smaller ones. And, and so they need a checklist. And that's one thing our members and we teach in, in advanced underwriting and advanced coverage where Keith helps us that to keep everything in order. And so the retail agent can emphasize the why. The why is because it's going to hurt us in case. It's not because Drew's pain in the, the puny. It's because we're worried about when Keith has to handle it, 
that attorney's going to find out about it and cost us money because they didn't do it. This is the danger we have here. Not that it contributes anything to the claim. Not that it, I mean, to the, the accident. Not that it contributes anything to negligence. It's just that thing. And so that's where the reptile theory becomes extremely uh, effective in these areas. Yeah, I think, you know, it, we may not like it, Tommy, but this kind of dates, dates you and me a bit. But the, just the claim that, that Drew and Keith described where everybody gets back in their vehicle and drives away 40 years ago, if we, as the insured and maybe the agent did the wrong thing, that's a $3,500 claim at the end of the day. And the adjuster, you've caused them a, a lot of wasted time, but it was 3,500 bucks maybe. Today, that sort of claim by virtue of not inflation, but the change in the legal environment in our country and case law, that's probably a $150,000 claim. So it can be. I think the point is it's too much money to do the wrong thing. If there's no consequence, right? And that would be what uh, in my, my life, I've seen so many truckers say, well, you know, I can just handle this myself. Or, that, you know, you guys don't do a good job anyway. So I just, I'd be better off doing this myself. I'm telling you that we all need to be standing on our heads saying, absolutely, that is a, the, you're wishing, you're wishing for something very bad to happen. Hey, um, moving on. Thank you very much. I want to read this, Tommy. This question came in this morning. It came in to you. So I'm going to address it to the kingpin. And this, um, by the way, all MCIF members, the Ask Tommy on our website is the most popular. It's right at the very top. So, and, and occasionally, Tommy will even ask somebody else to help him with an answer, but we'll always get back to you. So here's a question we haven't answered that came in this morning. Uh, actual situation. We have an insured who's been in business for two years. We bound coverage and requested filings. The carrier, the insurance carrier, posted a $750,000 liability limit versus the $1 million that was required by this motor carrier. The motor carrier's authority was revoked. The following day, we, meaning the retail agent, found out and the carrier corrected the filing. The insured's authority was reinstated the day after it was revoked. However, our motor carrier is having trouble getting loads because the brokers are looking at his authority and it shows he has only had it for a week or so. In other words, since it's been reinstated, they say they can't override, they cannot override their system. This would be the brokers, even though they can see the authority history and that it was revoked only for one day. Do you know how we can get around this, Tommy? No, because the shippers are using third-party screening companies. Uh, the one in or one is there, and they're on you can't load them list because of that revoked authority, and that's a concern that they have. The one other thing, and I'll ask Drew this. Drew, I have seen some of the motor carriers coming back against the insurer or who should have known to file the million, because they should have known the MC number and have looked at insurance required and not filed the million, the insurance carrier or the wholesaler, and I'm not going, I don't have any idea who those are, could be bought into this situation for not meeting it right. Drew, I, I, I have seen this happen before. But the other yep, thing we have to that Drew and I have talked about often in this, the other thing these third party do is if you cancel the filing midterm, you got the same problem here, even though you tend to renew. We got a number of our insurance carriers who cancel the filings every year. But these third party screenings say your insurance is in jeopardy. You don't have any more. And so your insurance 30 days on the no load list of these screening companies when you cancel the filings, uh, even though you intend to do the policy. Drew, I'll pass it on to you about those two things. You're exactly right, Tommy. There have been some experiences where folks have misfiled the filing, if you will. And there is some liability on the folks who are responsible for making that filing. That's why I would, I would always encourage the retail agent, the insured, you know, the actual motor carrier, obviously the wholesaler, all parties involved in this confirm what filings need to be made, what we're agreeing to make, and then make sure they happen as well. It's not, not as common as it used to be, but there have been occasions where the technology doesn't catch and that filing hasn't gone through. So there are a lot of things that can occur and the unfortunate part is, Nobody really recognizes this until there's the problem, until that 
truckers shut out or whatever the case may be, and then we're trying to undo the problem, which is an extreme concern. You've got loss of use, you've got all those other things that have um, kind of permeated this type of incident. So we have to be very assured that we're making those filings. In fact, you talk to anybody on my team, that's one of the most important things. We've got a list of things that are highly important. That's number one or number two up there every time. So we've got to execute and make sure that we post those filings correctly to these folks. As Tommy mentioned, we also run into scenarios with additional insured status, all these other folks that are ancillary to the trucking industry trying to offer some guidance for these motor carriers. And they act as a clearinghouse saying, we have to have all of these specs to recognize this motor carrier is properly insured for our customers. And unfortunately, like the scenario we have here, you've got somebody that doesn't really understand insurance. They're just going down a list, checking boxes to make sure that everything is here and accounted for, but they don't understand the reason why. And I think that's what this question poses is, we're dealing with a third party vendor who doesn't understand the circumstances of what happened. They're just looking at the visual. It doesn't look good from the optics perspective and they're done. Maybe also they don't know the distinction between reinstated authority and, and new authority. Because, the, right. because the, like you said, Tommy, the authority history is already on safer. Anyone can look it up. I don't know why the broker, the, the screening company could miss that. The term revoke, because the only time you revoke authority is when your insurance is canceled. That's why, and this is where most of them will have the revoke. The first question I would have asked this lady also, besides that, she went beyond, so it was not a question. Sometimes the broker requires the million and 750 is enough. So when she said what was required, then we have actually a, a letter that we send out to explain why we only meet what's required, not what's on the policy. That happens all the time. I'm sure uh, Drew gets that pushback. Why have my filings only 750? The broker wants a million. Well, all that's required is a million, and that's what we post because right. that's all you need for your authority. You still have the million dollars if the case is there, the 750 is there. So we get that requirement too. So when I first read that paragraph, my first question was, um, Who's requiring it? Then I read all the next sentence that said because it's been revoked is a question that, is, that came up. So I, I came to the conclusion that we just, that it was, we just discussed. The way this question was worded, my assumption, my assumption. Uh, in reading the question is that someone made a mistake. In other words, that the insured, uh, the insured authority required a filing for a million dollars. And what's the problem with that, Tommy? Let me ask this question: Can I, if, if I'm required as a truck line? to show proof of insurance uh, to the federal government for a million dollars coverage. Can I do that with two different files? Oh yeah, this is where you have the 91X. If you look at the public records, you can meet the requirements of FMCSA when you have an MC number with a 91 or 91X. The 91X came in place in 1980 when the limits went from 300 files into 500 and eventually 755 years later. And carriers weren't positioned to do that. Plus, you have the excess that Drew gets every day, where now you have a million and five. So the X allows you to layer it. So one carrier can make, um, say, 500,000 filing, which would not happen in today's marketplace, but five. And then another carrier could write uh, five X of five. And so you'd have two filings in that place, one primary and one excess. That's why the X is there, where the 91 does not allow you to limit or to layer. This is where the difference between the two. Every insurance carrier should be using the 91X, just in case the legislature get this hair up again to increase the limits. If, if they ever do that, you got a 91 out there, you might be liable for $400, $4 million uh, <laughs> without uh, thinking about it if you got the wrong filing. Well, Drew, I, I mean, Drew let me ask you a question. I'm, a simple question. When you have a policy rejection showing the million CSL, um, and you have to issue that NCS 90. Uh, what is the amount you're putting on there? The 750 minimum required on the filing on the NCS 90, or are you putting a full policy limit on that filing? Whatever's required by the filing, we would utilize that limit. Because I would think in the event of covered event and you were exposed under the NCS 90, you only want to be ex exposed to the minimum 750 that the Fed you know, requires and not the full amount of policy. If the uh, we got another question so on the chat window that 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 uh it's the same thing the screening companies for the brokers or shippers you want to read that question you can read it well, okay because i can't see it. Can you see it? 
Do any of you have a, a contact at Carrier 411? Uh, I currently have a client blackballed, meaning off of the don't give a load list by Carrier 401 services. He had someone steal his DOT and doubled, uh, doubled uh, booked loads under his authority. The carrier and I addressed this issue with the FMCSA several years ago, and it was discovered to be part of the large fraud scheme. But the uh, com the, the, the complex the com complication are still on the uh, issues like this. Hey, I've got a question, uh, Drew here uh, for you. Um, as uh, a younger, brighter member of the MCAF board, um, this question was asked of us, how do you see the Motor Carrier Insurance Education Foundation evolving over the next 10 years? <laughs> Great question. Uh, first and foremost, if I get back up to the uh, Carrier 411, I think maybe we ought to offer them an MCIF scholarship so they can attend our seminars. And maybe that'll help help educate them there. We'll Drew, do it. I, I, that's why I was going to meet them because I wanted to go there for them to attend this stuff and explain this to them so they'd get it right. And literally, I mean, he hung up on it. He said, you cannot come here and we won't let you in our building. And it's only a few blocks away from my house. We'll, and we'll, 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 we'll let Drew call. And, we'll and, let actually, Drew and call. actually had someone that, that knew them that gave me the person's name to call because it was someone, Rich Bramlett had some broker operation there and he dealt with somebody there. So I actually was talking to somebody. I think we'll let Drew make the call this time. <laughs> nice. But back to the future of the MCIF, I, I think one of the great things we're noticing, especially post COVID, we're seeing a great influx, influx of youthful folks in our industry, a lot of talent. And I'm amazed. I'm becoming one of those old guys very quickly because we've got a great group of very invested younger folks that are loving what we do. I mean, it's been a secret for a long time. Us four old farts have found great success in this industry, but now we have other young folks that are recognizing that. And the good news is they're pushing us. They're helping us aspire to be other things and opening our eyes to all kinds of other facets of this industry that we might not necessarily have been prepared for. So what I look at 10 years down the road are the folks that I work with every day on my team, the youthful folks, folks that work at our friendly competitors, the insurance side, and just see the overall evolution that is coming. And I think the question that we have that we often talk about is, how are we prepared to address those concerns, address those developments, address those needs that are coming? We're talking about autonomous vehicles. Well, I'll be darned, that's gonna be a big part of our future here. And you know the, the litigation of those, as Keith has spoken on, that's gonna be a big part of our future. So we have to be very anticipatory. And as Tommy has mentioned many times, the annual event isn't about what happened this past year, it's what's happening the coming year and the eight, next 18 months and 24 months. And I think that's very critical for those folks that recognize the value of the TRS designation in the MCIF. It is very forward thinking. We don't have all the answers now, but I will tell you, it's gonna look a hell of a lot different in 10 years. Well, Tommy, well, that, that reminded me just, I was today about the uh, the Panama Canal and the West Coast. Anything? If you remember, in 2015 or 14, we talked about the Panama Canal and intermodal being expanded, and the West Coast, East Coast will have more freight there. And all of a sudden, this is when New York was raising their their uh, bridges and all that, anticipation of the Panama Canal expansion uh, of the ship. So we try to stay ahead of things, Drew. Yep. Keith, what do you think? What do you think we'll look like 10 years from now? Well, I, I think in the immediate next couple of years, we're going to be appealing to a, a far more number of diverse insurance professionals, not just on the production side, at the retailers and the MGA level, but or the insurance company level. We're also going to now try to bring claims folks into the, into the equation and bring a robust claim curriculum so that we can now have in the same room at NCIS annual meetings a mixture of underwriting, retail, MGAs, insurance carriers, and claims people that deal with all the common issues truckers face today. So I think, to me, that's the most exciting near-term uh, change that I, I think uh, is happening. You know, uh, I think for, we, we often talk about the failings of our industry, but when I look at in my life, the entities that were performing much better than their peers, 
They were always very forward thinking. They were always very involved in education and they were curious people. They were not insular. They were rather outward reaching. And as we look at MCIF, I think one of the blessings of knowing Tommy Rook is of my friends, I think Tommy is about as forward looking, forward thinking, uh, what's the next thing as anyone that I've ever met. I think that's think that's the I think that's what he created with NCIF. I think it's up to all of us to make sure that as the years uh, progress, that to your point, Drew, we're looking forward. To your point, Keith, the claims curriculum, and when you think about insurance and the entities that succeed, there isn't production over here and claims over here. It's how, how to best handle risk. And that means that you have to have great knowledge in both of those areas. So mm -hmm. that's, that's the example of the claims curriculum that we hope to develop, right? In other words, it wouldn't, mm -hmm. be a, it, it wouldn't be a curriculum that Drew would not be interested in. It would be a curriculum that, that an underwriter such as Drew would be interested in and it would benefit greatly. So actually, guys, uh, we're about the time. That's probably Tommy. He's late for his tea time. I think you know we 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 kept him uh, we kept him five minutes longer than we should have. I think we're really done for the day. We've exhausted our that, time. That was Jake Taylor, by the way, John. That's J W. <laughs> he well, was going to ask me. He's asking me a, 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 a he sent me a text already. A coverage question about how where does the motor carrier get their uh, the owner operator get their coverage in the form written agreement? And I had to tell them it's I'm going to tell them it's the who's insured provision provision E in the motor carrier's coverage form. That's what I'm going to tell him in a few minutes. I thought I'd call him right back. Well, how 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 could we have a better way to end this uh, <laughs> ask the kingpin live than to watch the kingpin relay to us? a call over his mobile device. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Drew. And I hope that you have a great uh, afternoon, a great week, and I wish you a very Merry Christmas, by the way, as well. And hey, you guys, you're yours. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys.